love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, as you're standing, Habakkuk chapter 2. This begins a very, very important series. Habakkuk, Habakkuk, chapter 2, beginning with verse 2 and 3. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain. Write the what? And make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the what? Vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Over the next few weeks, I'll be focusing on one word. The word is vision. And I'm going to ask you to commit to the following small list. And here's what I'm going to ask of you in the next several weeks. I'm going to ask you to be here for every service, every service, and be open to God's Word. Resolve to participate, resolve to participate in what I call the vision process. It's not those that just hear the Word, but those that do it will be blessed. Pray, 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 and pray some more. Be honest and willing and open to forward movement. So if you're in a rut, get sick of the rut. If you haven't moved, get ready to move. Come on now. And make plans to be here on our 2020 Vision Celebration Day, September the 14th, 2014. Now look up here. This will be the most important day going forward we've ever had. And I'm asking you to fill this place up from top to bottom. Now that means that you need to be here and everyone else that's not here, hear me wherever you are. All you Lighthouse family that are not here today, I'm calling you to be here. Amen. They heard me. They heard me. Hallelujah. So I'm very excited about this. I want you to turn someone and tell them, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? It's time to get ready. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, let's, let's lift up our hands and our voices. Lord, I pray you'll, you'll just bless us with this word right now in the name of Jesus, that it will impregnate our spirit, that, Lord, we would have your word come alive in us today in the mighty and the awesome name of Jesus. And we worship you and we thank you that signs and wonders are going to follow the preaching of your word and people are going to be healed, delivered, touched, and restored in the name above all names. Hallelujah. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory. Let's give the Lord a great shout of praise for his word is true. His word is true. Now, one more thing. I want you to let me tell you something. I love you. Kathy loves you. Have we told you lately that we love you? You know, just, just remain standing uh, because I went back to my dad's church, and one thing I remember is he loved my mom. He loved my mom. He would sing that song to her. Have I told you? Then he would sing, don't sit under the apple tree with anybody else but me. Now, that brings me to next week's announcement. Next week, I'm going to be preaching an illustrated sermon. Now, how many of you, your favorite dessert? Now, now not one of your favorites. My dad always said, I only like two kinds of pie, hot and cold. How many of you, your favorite dessert is apple pie? Whoa, Rod just got the Holy Spirit. Wow, hallelujah. He got surged. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Woo. How many of you? How many of you? How many of you? Raise your hand. Your favorite is apple pie. What do you like to drink with it? Glass of cold milk or what? Coffee? Ice cream? You want ice cream with it? Okay, how many of you, if I brought some next week, it could be your favorite dessert. I mean, it could very well be. Come on, it's going. To, all right. So next week, I'm going to have some. Who is very, very good at homemade apple pie? You can make a great homemade apple pie. Who is it? 
Oh, you're all wanting me. You're all wanting me to buy one. Do you have time, Dottie? Do you have time? Apple pie? Okay. All right. You have time for about two of them? Might as well make two. Okay. That's all I'm saying. I'm not going any further. I'm not going further. How many of you really love um, some fresh, hot, homemade lasagna? That's really, well, that has nothing to do with it. All right. Praise the Lord. Oh, I love you all. Come on, let's give the Lord a joyful shout. He's in his house. I feel his joy. Hallelujah. Well, you, <laughs> you know, you, as you're seated today, I want to deposit a lot of word into you. Now, I want to just tell you there's a couple texts that have jumped out in my spirit. One is Acts 2 and 17. It talks about your young men, your old men will dream dreams and see visions. One is uh, Proverbs 29, 17, and it simply says, without a vision, you will die. Now, listen. Without a vision, you're going to die. Let me just make this very clear. Here, I want to throw some words up on the screen and write them down because these are words that a lot of people um, see and a lot of people read, and they're not sure quite what they mean. There's words like goals, hopes, plans, dreams, mission, purpose. Now, here's a couple things that these words have in common. The first thing that these words have in common is that most people have none of them. I promise you that some of you really have checked out in terms of what God wants for my future. You have gone into survival mode. You've gone into maintenance mode. Come on now. Oh, yeah. And you've just kind of settled in, and I'm going to address why you have done that, and I'm going to tell you why you've done that and why when I do it, I've done that. But I will sum all these words up, goals, plans, hopes, dreams, purpose, mission, in one word, vision. So for the purpose of these next four weeks, you can call them your goals, you can call them your mission in life, you can call it your purpose in life, you can call it making plans, and when I bring this illustrated sermon to you next week, it will all unfold very clearly to you. Now, how many rods? Rod will be here next Sunday. No, Rod's going to be here. He may may be dragging with one leg, but he's going to be here. Do, did I say you'll get to eat a piece of pie? You can smell it, all right. But I'll tell you what, since Rod just got revival right there, I wish you'd have seen that. Hoo, hoo, hallelujah. I'm going to give him a nice piece of homemade dotty pie. Oh, praise the Lord. Mm, my, 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 my. And so next week, all this will be coming clear to you, how the plans, the goals, the activities of God formulate from your vision. But let me make this very clear. Vision is what I want you to write down, three words, God's preferred future. God has a preferred future. Now, listen, we all know we have a future. I mean, unless we die, we have a future of tomorrow. Unless Jesus comes, we have a future of tomorrow. But is it God's future? Is what I want for my future and what God wants for our future the same. And let me promise you, you'll never be happy with just your future. You'll only be happy and content and fulfilled and completely at peace when you have stepped into God's future. Because really, Darcy, if you give me a wave, she represents God's future. And Jim, if you give me a wave, he represents our own future. For most people, they're about that far apart. But Jim, if you'll come and walk this way, and Darcy, if you'll come and walk this way, over the next few weeks, we're going to begin, real quick, we're going to begin to connect, we're going to get closer to your future and closer to God's future, and what we're going to try to do, we're going to get these futures so they're, they're in sync, amen? You look great, Darcy. I love you. Thank you for cooperating. We got to get our future and God's future on the same page. Are you with me this morning? And so you know that Jeremiah 29, 11 says, um, I know the thoughts and I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are good plans to bring you a hope and a future. Hallelujah. And so I want God's preferred future for my life. Here's something that the Lord spoke to me. We left Napanee Sunday afternoon and went directly to a, a conference that we had to go to annually. Um, the, the executive presbytery meets on Sunday night. I had meetings Sunday night, all day Monday and Tuesday. 
And um, in those meetings, a young pastor was asked to bring devotions. And I want to read. You understand something. I know what it's like to have a vision. I am a visionary. I'm able to see what God wants us to go. I'm able, I'm, I capture the vision. I've never had a problem, you know, not seeing where God wants us to go, both in a personal level and as a church. It's always been very clear. But what can happen is that issues present themselves and you leave, you leave where Darcy represented God's vision and you lean all the way over to doing it on your own. Come on now. Are you glad you're listening real good? Here's the point. This young preacher said that the Lord gave a word to him, and here's what it was. That you are no longer living for the dreams and the vision I've given you. There have been dreams and visions that lay dormant in your life for years. That you no longer hold on to. And God is asking you if you're still believing. He said, it has been so long that you can even barely remember because life has stolen your dream and your vision. Come on. And then he went on to say, God said to you, I am not handing out smaller dreams. And at the conclusion of that devotion, he says, I'm not sure if this spoke to anybody, but if it spoke to somebody, stand. I could not get to my feet fast enough. I didn't care if I was the only one who stood. I didn't care if I stood alone. I didn't care if they talked about me. I didn't care what they thought about me. I got a word from the Lord, and I knew it was for me. Hallelujah. And today, some of you have allowed your dreams to lay dormant. You have forgotten even really the extent of the vision God has given you because life has stolen away your dreams and your visions. And now I'm calling these next few weeks Resurrection Sunday. They are going to be a day where your vision is restored and resurrection. How many realize that Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life? I know there are people in this church that need a good old-fashioned calling out like he said at the tomb of Lazarus. Come forth. Your vision's dead. Your vision is buried. Your vision's in a tomb. It already stinks, and you need Jesus to come in and say, come on out of there, for there's life still in you. Hallelujah. What happens is that there's times we need to say we're going to resurrect those dreams, and we need to allow ourselves to dream again. God is a God of the vision. What happens is we slip into survival mode. I want you to think about that. We go from going forward with a vision to just surviving and maintaining. And here's the thing I've noticed about people that are victorious and churches that are victorious. They're always planning. You know, when that young pastor shared about the resurrection of the vision, in my briefcase at my side, I have the Lighthouse 2020 vision. We have worked on it. We have prayed over it. We have dealt with it, thought about it, been impregnated with it now for several months, and he did not know. In fact, Dave Delp called him just a day before the conference and said, I believe, Chad, that God will give you a word for the people. Let me tell you something. God loves you, and God knew I would be there. I'm just going to take it all personal. I'm just, some of you don't take this church personally enough. You don't take this word personally enough. you got an attitude, well, I, you know, it's all right, but, I mean, it's not for me. No, baby, this is for you. There is not one person don't need this today. It's not for the person behind you, in front of you, on the left. not for the person that's not here. This is for you. Shout, it's for me. And I took it personal, and he began to talk about how you can resurrect, and God isn't going to give you a smaller dream. And then I thought about that this 2020 vision that I'm going to share with you on September 14th. It is what God wants this church to look like should Jesus tarry is coming by the year 2020. And I want to get you thinking about not only what God wants this church to look like in the next five years, but what he wants your life to look like. You're not too young. You're not too old. Dreams and visions come to us in all areas of life. Hallelujah. 
But people that are successful, people that are hopeful, people that are victorious, they're always planning, they're always looking ahead, they're motivated to do great things for Christ with a purpose and a mission. And I will tell you that what happens to our vision is that we suffer the oppression of the enemy. It's kind of like when Jesus said there were tares sown among the wheat and he announces the enemy has done this. And today, I'm going to call out every scoundrel, every lying, vile, hideous, hostile opposition that has come and ripped you off from your vision, and we're going to beat him down into the blood-covered ground at Calvary's Hill. That's what we're going to do. Hallelujah. Because let me tell you something about Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he gave you a vision, he's not going to relent from that. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He's not going to say, well, I gave him a vision, but I had no idea all that was going to happen to him, so I'm going to give him a smaller one. If he would change his vision for you, he'd have to change who he is. But here's what happens. As we call out the enemy of your vision and the enemy of the lighthouse vision, Here's what happens. We come under these attacks. I'm going to give you a few of them, and I'm going to just minister to, the, to these, and I'm going to just, I'm just going to pull these bullies out, and we're going to give them what they need. Come on, somebody. Number one, evil, evil opposition is your enemy. Paul writes in Ephesians 6 and 10 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we have the devilish schemes we are up against we are up against his authorities and his powers and his principalities and spiritual forces in heavenly places this dark world is opposing your god-given vision he said well pastor i don't have a vision well you need to get one because that is an aligning with god's will god wants you to have a vision and just because you don't have it doesn't mean he didn't have one for you Hallelujah. And I'm calling all of us to pull out of maintenance, to pull out of survival mode, and let's begin to thrust forward in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And ever since God dropped this in my spirit about March, it dawned on me that in five years, 2020, and 2020 is crystal clear, perfect vision that what does God want us to look like in the next five years? And I'm going to be the first to tell you that what I put in your hands is unprecedented. I have never laid out a five-year plan and put it in your hands. So this September 14th, shout September 14th, I will be here. And I'm going to put this in your hands, and furthermore, you're going to begin to start thinking about your life, what you'd like to look like in five years. Come on, somebody. Hello. Amen. And here's why you may not do that. It's because the devil's going to come and lie to you. He's going to oppress you. He's going to bring principalities and powers and attack you. But aren't you glad you're part of the church where the gates of hell cannot prevail against us? We are on the winning side. The Lord is on our side. Woo, hallelujah. And if he is for us, who can be against us? Let me call out another enemy. Overwhelming circumstances. I'm reminded of Elisha with a young man, and they were surrounded by the enemy. Completely surrounded. How many realize the enemy doesn't hit you on one side? People say, well, rain just pours. I'm getting hit from every angle. Well, that is the enemy. He comes in on every angle to try to ambush you and to defeat you. Now, I want everybody to hear me. If the devil can steal your vision, he steals your victory. Because vision and victory are the same. If the devil can steal your vision, he'll steal your joy, your peace, your faithfulness. He will keep you focused on today, and we have to be forward-moving in our future thinking because until Jesus comes, he's got a future all planned out for us, and I want to align with that future. I don't want to be at the end of my time and say, well, I did my own thing, but God and I weren't really on the same team. We are to be co-laborers and partners together in my life. Hallelujah. So Elisha is in his room, and the young man goes out onto the porch, and he looks around north, south, east, and west, and all the kid sees are bad guys completely surrounding. You've seen the cowboy movies? 
when the, the wagon train stops and you look up and all the Indians are all around. Come on. And he went back and he was scared and he was petrified and intimidated. And he said, alas, master, we are surrounded. And Elisha cried out to the Lord, Father, open the lad's eyes that he might see. And he sent him back out to the same spot. And now he reports back and he says, oh, around those who are surrounding us are the armies of God. Woo! And you may say the enemy's on every side. Yes, he is. But God and his armies are on every side of your enemy. Hallelujah. So no wonder we read Romans 5 and 20. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Because God will never be outnumbered by your enemy. Hallelujah. And so then he comes back, and here's what I love what he said. Write this down somewhere. There are more for us <laughs> than there are against us. Ha! <laughs> Isn't that a good report? I think that'd be a good place for you to jump and shout and give the Lord some good old praise. There are more for us. There are more for us. Oh, you didn't hear me. There are more for us than there are against us. Woo! Hallelujah. And so when you're overwhelmed by circumstances, you can just check out on your vision and you can just begin to think about today. Some of you have been overwhelmed by your circumstances. Your circumstances have brought you to a place where it's just like, I don't know what I'm going to do here. But here's what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Hallelujah. The third enemy that hits us is the enemy called impatience and weariness. I could preach a series on all these, but I want to just remind you that next week, all you apple pie lovers, <clears throat> Rod, can you make it a whole week? So now I want to get this deep in your heart, impatience and weariness. This is what the saga of Abraham and Sarah is all about because God appeared to him and said, you're going to be a father of a great nation. And so they kind of had this dialogue, and, and three, three angels came and visited, and they told Sarah, and all the word came out, Abraham and Sarah, you're going you're gonna to just, your descendants will be like the seashore with all the sand. Look up in the stars. That's going to be your family. And they had this big chuckle. Oh, God. Oh, oh God. Stop it, G. Stop it. Stop it. Because we're too old. We don't have no children. We're not going to have no children. It's not happening for us. And when, you, oh, praise the Lord. Anybody glad you're going to hear what I'm about to say? I can't wait to say it. When you get weary and tired and impatient, you think, okay, God, what is up? You gave me, God, do you understand? Look here. You gave me this vision, and it's not happening. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what Sarah did. Sarah had this conversation with Abraham. said, look. We know what's been said to us. We know the promise, and it's not happening. So in the tents, good-looking Hagar, she's my, she's, my, she's my maid, and she'll, she'll take care of everything. Just go, just go make it happen on your own. And what happens is that we make a baby, but it wasn't kind of baby of promise. It's kind of baby of the flesh. Come on now. We create an Ishmael. Have you ever done that? You think, I'm trying to help God out here, but I wish I hadn't. Come on, church. And Ishmael is over in the Middle East today still fighting us. He is still thriving and living and bombing against the people of God. He's still there. He still hates Jews. Yes, he does. And, he's, and he, it happened because someone abandoned their God-given vision. And let me tell you something. Before you feel too bad about that, if the father of faith, Abraham's a father of faith, and it was imputed unto Abraham righteous that he should be called the friend of God. If the friend of God got a little impatient, don't be upset and write yourself off because you get a little impatient. Because I know some of you have struggles with patience. For me, never, but for you, yes. Oh, I have patience, but I want it right now. Come on, somebody. 
So we've got to get in our mind that these enemies of, of the enemy, the enemies of opposition, impatience, and weariness comes against our vision. Yes, it does. Hallelujah. Let me give you another one. The lack of joy and enthusiasm. Here's what Romans 12 and 11 says. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be enthusiastic. Hezekiah ran into this in Isaiah, and I wrote this down as we were worshiping in God's presence this morning. Isaiah 37 and 3, it won't be on the screen, but it says, This is a day of trouble, and this is a day of rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to bring birth. But there is no strength. Every mother knows that at the biggest time of, of your life, when you are about to birth that baby, when you're at the heightened level of pain, you need strength the most. Come on, church. And what God has saying to us is that many of us have stopped. We have aborted the birthing that's been in us. God has impregnated us with a vision. God has impregnated me as the pastor of this church with a vision of what I know he wants us to become. And when we get weary and when we get tired and we lose joy and we lose enthusiasm, there is no strength because Nehemiah said in Nehemiah 8 and 10 that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we just lose our thrill, we lose our zeal, we lose our ambition and our enthusiasm, and we say, oh, what's the use? I know some of you have done that. What's the use? Forget it. I'm just frustrated. It's not going to happen. I'm going I'm to quit expecting so much. I'm going to lower my expectations. And let me tell you something. If God said in his word, he'll deliver on his word. But you have got to have the joy there to birth it through. Amen. Number five. I'm calling these enemies out. This is the enemy of despair and discouragement. Psalm 3 and 3. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. You're the glory and the lifter of my head. Despair comes following a victory, and despair comes following a defeat. 450 prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 17 were smitten down by the fire of God and by the word of Elijah, and it wasn't just, just a few hours later, this same prophet who performed one of the greatest miracles of all time, when that, when that water was licked up, the stone was licked up, the burnt sacrifices were lift, licked up, licked up and God began just to pour down his power on that mountain then you see this young man just sitting under a tree and he said oh God that I would die God that I would die despair and discouragement sets in and he begins to steal us from our vision anybody would raise your hand right now and say pastor I feel like you're talking to me somebody come on oh let's start all over How many raise your hand and say, Pastor, I know you're talking right to me. That's what I thought you said. So the rest of you, you've never been in despair or discouragement. Well, praise God. That is great to hear. Hallelujah. But for me, I've been discouraged. I know what it looks like. I can tell you that in no uncertain terms, God gave us a vision for this church. And we had our annual retreat with our deacons, and I was sharing this story about how the Lord birthed this vision for this building back in 1998. In 1998, this vision was birthed into reality in my spirit. Six years later, following years of unbelievable attack, this building became a reality. This building that you sit in today started out as a vision in my heart. And I was sleeping in a hotel. I was going down to Brownsville Revival, and I was sleeping in Alabama Hotel on a uh, Tuesday night. And in my dream, it was a God dream and God vision, I began to see all of this. And for some of you who don't know this story, it was so I, Kathy and I called a local uh, company, an architect, and they, they you know, they brought this vision, they brought this plan, and it was okay, but it just, it just, there was something lacking, something missing. 
And then I learned over here in Brookville, um, Ohio, over in that area, there was a, a man who built churches, and he had built I don't know how many hundreds of churches, and he and I made a connection, and we're sitting back here where the force was, and he took a pencil, and he began to draw upside down. And he began to draw all these angles you see here, and the arch, and the lighthouse, and he began to draw, and God appeared in that room, and as he began to draw, he uh, began to draw under the inspiration of God the vision I had seen for this building. So we bought off the previous firm to their dismay because we were in contract with them, only it cost us some money to get out of the contract because I said, I'm sorry, but what you had in plan is not what I know this place ought to look like. And I did not know that Bill Gunther, would, this would be his very last church to design. And then the Lord took him to heaven. There is, however, something else I said. Some of you will remember the three pronged part of that vision we would build this church we would fill it and we would pay for it so guess what I get to fight when it's not paid for and it's not filled yet put it up there discouragement and despair let me see it on the screen I get to fight this I get to fight the devil saying, oh, you and your bright ideas. Come on now. Am I, talking, am I talking to the rest of you yet? I was hoping I would talk to everybody, but apparently no one's having vision issues but me. But I will promise you today, if you will accept this and you'll take this personal, your life will get out of that old rut and routine because the devil is a liar. He is telling some of you, it's not going to improve. It's not going to get better. There's no change for you. There's no fix for this problem. There is no way you are ever going to get where you thought you were going to be. So just, just go ahead and take a, a step back and compromise and just feel a little better about yourself. Don't get into the push of the vision. Don't get into the praying about the vision because it's not happening for you. But I want to tell the devil, you are a big, fat, ugly dog liar. <laughs> when I hand that vision out in a few weeks, it's not nothing small. I know that's probably not good English, but it's not nothing small. It is a very big, aggressive vision. I will promise you that it is from God. And some of you haven't had a vision so big that if God didn't come through, you would, you would fail because you've been playing it safe. And that brings me to the number one enemy of your vision. It is the enemy of fear. It is a voice that says, if you write something down, if you start planning, and if you start dreaming, and if you start thinking, you will be the biggest failure in town. But let me make this very clear about that. It is easy for people who don't have courage to judge you and call you a failure. But I would rather fail trying than fail not trying. One man got out on that water and he sunk, and Jesus had to rescue Peter and put him back in the boat. And everyone said, oh, Peter, all 11 disciples, Peter, ha, you're all wet. And he looked at all of them and said, yeah, and you are all dry. You can't walk on water until you get out of the boat. And God is going to stir up and resurrect your dream and your vision. And you're going to once again be impregnated. And you are not going to be afraid. One time in Mark, we read the story in Mark chapter 6 that Jesus sent them over. He said, you go from this point across the sea to that point, And I'm going to pray and I'll meet you over there. 
And the Bible says that the storm began to toss and the disciples were afraid. And Jesus walked out on the water and he said, peace be still. I'm telling you that fear is keeping some of you back. We dealt with this in a financial blessed life series. Fear keeps you from obeying God financially. Fear keeps you from making that pledge. Fear keeps you from writing those checks. Fear keeps you from witnessing. Fear keeps you from praying. Fear keeps you from coming faithfully to the house of God. Fear is your number one one adversary and if you and I are going to once again be driven by a vision we've got to face our fear hallelujah come on church what fear says is that God won't keep his word fear says God didn't mean what he said fear says you God will let you down fear says God will fail you fear says God will turn his back on you he will abandon you that's what fear says but faith says I'm going to live like God's word is true I'm going to live like I believe the Bible I'm going to live like I know God cannot fail me Woo! hallelujah and so I'm going to ask all of you right now over the course of the next couple of weeks to begin to dream again don't count the cost. Don't figure it out. Don't make sense of it. Don't try to think, well, how can I afford it? Don't try to, don't try to think, well, who's going to help me? How's it going to happen? I know, I know that's how we think. Come on, church. But for once, set aside your practicality of your reason and just begin to pray and let God speak to you. And say, God, what do you see my future looking like? What is the preferred future you have for me? Hallelujah. I will promise all of you, it's not average. It's not ordinary. It's not mediocre. It's not okay. It is awesome. It is great. And I will tell you, like I've told you a thousand times, somebody's going to have a great vision. And it might as well be me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are not people that live by our sight. We don't walk by what we see. We don't walk by our rationale. We don't walk by what makes sense. We walk by faith and not by sight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo! I want to impress God with the boldness of my prayer. I want to hear God say, oh, wow, wow, what we got going here. My, 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 look at here, man of faith. Look at here, woman of faith. Praise the Lord. I mean, to say, okay, Lord, I have a vision of having enough gas to get to work. You know what? Somehow that will happen. But once you get a vision of having enough to buy a 1,000 people gas to get to work. Lord, I have a vision of getting my bills paid. Well, that's, that's, you think that's going to impress a mighty God? How many know? Now, this is where I need a bunch of you to raise your hand so I don't lose a victory. Are you ready? I'm just preempting this. I'm warning you because, you know, I can get impatient. No, but how many realize we can think way too small sometimes? We can just think too small. But do we have a small God? We have a big God. So the 2020 vision brings into focus, brings into clear reality of what I know that this church can accomplish and what you can accomplish and what your life can do. So I'm going to make this very clear. I'm about to close. Here's what I'm saying. I want you to begin to write down if Jesus tarries. Look, if he comes, we don't care. I mean, someone else can pay this building off. Come on. Hallelujah. I know some of you are going to be happy about this, but you don't even have to pay tithes in heaven. Well, wait a minute. I'm going to be there. Yeah, I'll probably try to receive tithes. Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, make this very clear. If Jesus comes, that's fine. He's going to interrupt somebody's plans. We don't care. But just pretend we got to pray like he's, and live like he's come today, but plan like he's not come for another hundred years. But what do we want this church to look like? But what do you want to look like? What do you want to look like? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Braden, come up here. I, I had a vision. Come here quickly. Quickly. I know you're out of shape. He ran a, what did you run this morning? 
a half marathon this morning. Stand up for a minute. Please, please stand up here a couple steps. Wow. I can't believe he ran a half marathon this morning. Right? Well, some of us could be up here saying, I ran a half marathon this morning. Let's say, for example, I ran a half You're going to believe one of us and one of us you're not going to believe. Thank you. But my question is, who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe today? Some of you are hearing this voice. Oh, no, not the vision speech again. How many of you would be honest and say, I know the devil has really knocked the wind out of my cells in the area of my future, my vision. Come on, raise your hand. You just, yeah. But watch this. God is the God of resurrection. Amen. Mrs. Anthony, are you capable of coming? Just try to remember what you're doing. You have other things on your mind, more important the last couple of weeks. God has given you a vision. And even your stupid mistakes hasn't changed his mind. Well, so if you've messed up, all you got to do is repent and get back in step. Stand with me. God, today, and let's lift our hands across this church. Today, God, today, you're going to begin the resurrection process. God, you have told people that you want to see them in a life of blessing. And the circumstances and the lies of the enemy and the oppression of the enemy, the weariness, the fatigue, the circumstances, the impatience, because it hasn't happened, because it hasn't happened, we've given up on it. I'm glad to report to this church that there's been times I may have given up on my vision, but you never gave up on me. You never have. Let's just wait on the Lord. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. Don't believe the lie of the devil. to prayer I want you all to look up here and I want to really I know I've asked you to raise your hands I've had you say amen all that stuff but I really if you've ever engaged in obedience to your pastor this series is a good place to start I'm going to ask you to do a couple things I'm asking something of you and for some of you you've already done these type of things and for some you never have our text today says this. What's this? Because I know some of you aren't big writers. 
But the text says to you, so you don't have to believe me. I'm not the only one commanding you. Write. Write the vision and make it plain. Today, one of the visions I have is this altar is going to be filled with miracles. Included in our 2020 vision, Lighthouse will be a place of regular visible miracles. I see that. I don't want anyone on our watch going to heaven one day before God wanted them to. I don't want anybody having despair instead of joy. Write the vision and make it plain. I'm going to ask you to do this. We're going to obey God's word here. But over the course of the next few weeks, as God gives you anything, what you want to look like in 2020, write it down. How many promise? How many promise? We're not going pinky, but I can't get to all the pinkies. But how many promise you're going to do that? Raise your hand. I need to see that. I need to see that promise. Come on, I need to see it. You're going to write it down. You've got to do this because this is what the Lord told us. There's a book that somebody should be writing. Resurrect that vision. There's an instrument that someone should be learning to play. Resurrect that vision. Some of you have a prosperity vision. You see others prosper, and you think, I could be one of those. There's a business that someone should be operating that produces a great windfall. And the devil's told you you'd lose, you'll lose everything if you attempt it. But I feel the Lord speaking to me today that if God has given you that, if, God, if it is a God vision, it, it cannot fail. It will come to pass. Now, church, I want to tell you, this church will be filled. Let me start all over. This church will be filled. No, I want to start all over because I know everybody has, wants to amen on that. I'll give you one more try. Oh, I'm so patient, I impress myself. Hallelujah. Now, this church will be. Balcony. Every brass, every class. And this church will be paid for. So please, please, please begin to write it down. Write it down, write it down, write it down. Write it down, write it down. Whatever, don't, don't, don't figure into it, just write it down. Hallelujah. Write it down. Amen. If you're here today and you're sick, I want you to walk to the altar quickly. If you're here today and you're struggling, if you're struggling, and you know what that means, you know what that looks like to you, if you're struggling, I want you to come to the altar immediately. If you're struggling, I want you to come to the altar immediately if you're struggling if you're not finding your footing just as the struggle began it will have an end it will not go on indefinitely
If you need a financial breakthrough, you're tired of the pressure, I want you to come immediately. say I want prayer over any area and you're not yet here, please come. Kathy and I are going to lay hands on you and God's going to answer the prayer. God will do it today. You will be healed today. Peace is going to come today. Peace is going to come today. Concerned about a family member, whatever the need is, 